Hello there. Long time no see, so I left the commentary on the poems in Li Shangjing's The Patent Lute a couple of months ago. I'm afraid I've been very busy of late with work and other, other such stuff, but I hope to be getting back on track from now onwards, and uh, I hope to be producing at least one poem per, let's say, every three days or so, perhaps daily, during the summer holidays. So to recap, the previous video was a reading of Li Shangjing's The Patent Lute, as long as uh, some biographical information uh, and some contextual historical information about Li Shangjing. And, and uh, we're going to reread the poem again, and then we will proceed to comment it couplet by couplet. The Patent Lute. No special reason the patent lute has 50 strings. Each string, each fret, a reminder of better times. Master Chuang awoke from his dream, bewildered butterfly. King Wang's love lives on in the cuckoo's cry. The moon shines over the great ocean. Pearls weep. The sun warms blue mountain. Jade smokes. This feeling might have lasted forever in my memory. But in the moment, it was already fading away. Now, as we said in the introduction, this is a very, you could say, a very dark poem. Um, there, there has been and there continue to be many, many um, interpretation debates about its meaning. And so, so it's not apparently transparent. Uh, different interpretations basically oscillate between considering it a love poem or not considering it a love poem. For those who consider it a love poem, there are also many uh, subvariants uh, uh, um, referring to specific women that um, Li Shangjing might have met. Those who do not consider a love poem consider it a lament. Well, uh, again, there are a lot of interpretations here as well. Some consider it a lament for his deceased wife. Some consider it a lament for the poet's failure in, in position, in, in, in political, in administrative success. Others consider it a meta-poetical reflection on the art of poetry itself. And uh, those who defend this believe that this poem was uh, the first of, uh, of, of, of the selection of his own poetry that Li Shangjing compiled while he was still alive. And others yet think uh, that the different uh, scenes, the different images that are painted in, in the couplets, especially the middle ones, uh, are meant to evoke musical uh, themes. So still others imagine that there is a, a combination or a juxtaposition of, of different themes. Uh, this is the idea of uh, James J. Y. Liu, who is the greatest expert writing in English uh, on the poetry of Li Shangjing that I know. And uh, yeah, his attitude is that this poem yeah, synthesizes you know, different strands at the same time um, with, with different resonances, which include the personal lament at uh, failure in office, the personal lament at loss of loved ones, um, the personal uh, and felt lament also at... Um, at uh, the passage of time, at the irreality of the real, of the untrustworthiness of memory. So, you know, I, I'm, I was pretty much convinced by the argument uh, James J.Y. Liu and the commentary he makes in his own book on this topic, in, in the poetry of Li Shangjing. And when we finish commenting this, I'll include readings of two other versions of this poem, one of them James J.Y. Liu's, the other one from A.C. Graham, from his book Poems of the Late Time. So let's go couplet by couplet of this version, which is uh, Geoffrey Waters. First couplet. No special reason the patent lute has 50 strings. Each string, each fret, a reminder of better times. So the poem begins with the image that was allegedly later taken to give title to this untitled poem, the patent lute. Now, the patent lute is an instrument called the se, um, one of a, a series of traditional Chinese musical instruments. And uh, this instrument has, um, at least in the time of Li Shangjing, and I imagine until now, it has 25 strings. And there was a legend that in remote antiquity, um, it had actually had 
double that number, 50 strings, but uh, because uh, a goddess was playing such sad music on those strings, a god decided to divide the string, sorry, divide the instrument, cut it into two, uh, so two instruments of 25 strings, which would be less sad, which would create a less poignant music. So the poem begins with this image, this, re, this, this uh, patent lute, and it has a, a, this reflection. So each string, each fret, reminds one of better times. So the lute, at least in the first couplet, seems to be acting as, um, as a metaphor for the passage of time. So the poet is probably getting older, each uh, string, each fret that he sees in the 25 string lute that is in front of him reminds him of times past, perhaps of better times, of happier times, of youth. And uh, so, so th this image would connect to the passage of time, but also reminiscing and lamenting uh, the, the passage of time and perhaps the lack of success or the sufferings brought along by the passage of time, um, could also start to be introducing that topic of the unreality of, 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 in this case, of the past. The past is only remembered through memory. Do those better times that one reminisces really exist at all beyond one's memory? Um, no special reason the pattern lute has 50 strings, so the legend tells why it, it why it had fifty and now it has twenty five, but you know you could interpret this also as pointing in the direction of, of 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 the arbitrariness uh, of, of 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 a man's uh, allocation of years. So it's clear that the lute and its strings are evoking for the poetic persona the passage of years. And why does a specific person have a certain number of years or other? That depends on different factors, and uh, you know they, they they depend on chance mostly. And uh, uh, so, why should fifty strings? Uh, why should fifty years be the, the the limit of a man's age of a man's time? Okay, let's continue with the second couplet. Now, as you know, we mention it very frequently. The second and the third couplet of a, um, a regulated poem, in this case, a uh, uh, what was it? This was uh, the seven-word regulated poem. Yeah, you have the the five-character regulated poem and the seven-word. Now, the the second and the third couplet are usually the parallelistic couplets, and in those, the the words and the images in each couplet have to be strictly parallelistic and usually antithetical. So they have to belong to the same type of class of word and even. Mm, the same semantic area, if you wish, but generally contrasted, like sun, moon, day, night, uh, spring, autumn, that sort of thing, or animals, different animals. So the, the second couplet, which is the first parallelistic couplet, after this introduction of this lute and of this passage uh, as a metaphor for a passage of time, the second and, and the third couplets will evoke images. So in a, in a regulated poem, generally, uh, this is done through... And generally, the first parallelistic couplet, that is the second couplet of the poem, has a more um, a more descriptive and a more generic um, image or set of images. And the third couplet, which is the second parallelistic couplet, has more specific, more subjective, more emotional, but also more more zoomed in images. And that's the general whole product progression in the couplets of a regulated poem, usually. So in this case, the second couplet. Um, includes historical precedents. The difference, perhaps, between the images in the second and the, the third couplet in this poem is that the third couplet is more pictorial, even though it has res literary resonances because the images are chosen are connected to to literary images and conventions. Um, but but the second the second couplet is really a little bit less pictorial and more literary. It includes specifically the names of the literary and historical uh, exemplar exemplars that are quoted. So second one, Master Zhuang awoke from his dream, bewildered butterfly. King Wan's love lives on in the cuckoo's cry. So two anecdotes here. Master Zhuang, he's very famous. He was the author of the. Well, we don't know if he really existed, but it's the name and, and his, his name and biography are appended to a, 
late Warring States book called the Chuang Tzu, the Book of Master Chuang, Taoist classic that was very popular in, in, in classical China um, because of its literary nature, of its uh, paradoxical images. Now, the anecdote here referred is very famous, even for people who are not too acquainted with classical Chinese literature. Master Zhuang once dreamt that he was a butterfly, and then he woke up. And while he had you know, just recently woken up, he doubted if he really was Master Zhuang, who had had a dream of being a butterfly, or if he might not perhaps be a butterfly dreaming right now that he was Master Zhuang. So it's a, a classical paradox that, 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 that emphasizes something very dear to the Taoist tradition, um, the lack of certainty in rational knowledge, the paradoxes of language, and uh, you know just the general uncertainty about uh, everything, about states, conditions, impermanence and change. Uh, here it's probably being evoked. We we talked about in the first couplet about the years passing by, and the, the the almost unreal nature of those memories of the past that one has experienced. You could say that evoking Master Zhuang in this anecdote is further emphasizing for the poet. It's further illustrating for the reader this idea of how difficult it is to really ascertain that things are real, that things happened, that memories are trustworthy, even one's own strongest memories. And, you know, you could also connect this with literature. Literature creates emotions, creates memories, but, you know, they are, you could say they are a bit artificial. Liter literature, after all, is, you know, a fiction. It creates a world in a poem or in a text that is not strictly real. You know, it's it's verisimil, Aristotle would say. And and, and we could go into other fields here. The, the fact that a, a reader that reads a love poem of a, of a sad story that perhaps never existed, feels moved nevertheless by the literary machine of the poem to feel the emotions, to empathetically feel the emotions of the scene depicted and perhaps the emotions that the writer of the poem was feeling when he wrote it. So Master Zhuang, his, his anecdote is pointing towards this surreal nature of, 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 of memory, of writing. The second image, King Wang's love lives on in the cuckoo's cry. This is a darker image. It's a story from a, a king of the, the state of Wu who had uh, apparently fallen in love with the wife of one of his uh, ministers and had an illicit affair with her. After that, he died out of shame and he was reincarnated in, in a cuckoo. So the cuckoo's cry in spring evokes uh, and, uh, King Wang's love and and but also his shame. So this image is a little bit more ambiguous. It seems to be a love image, just as Master Chuang's image um, emphasizes the, the, the ambiguity about reality and unreality, about memory and reality, uh, about, about um, emotions felt because of uh, literary arousal and emotions generally felt. This second image seems to point in the love direction, which is why it was taken by many uh, of the defenders of the interpretation that this is a love poem. Um, so it seems, uh, you know, to evoke that sadness at, uh, at the end of, of a love relation had in the past, or perhaps at, uh, uh, at an illicit love relationship like King Wan's. But anyway, mm, both images, Master Chuang's as a butterfly, King Wang as a cuckoo, mm, apart from, you know, following the parallelism properly, both at the same time seem to be working in, 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 in this direction of indistinctiveness. Is it, must, is, it, is it Master Chuang or is it a butterfly? Is it a cuckoo or is it King Wan? What's the reality? Reality is difficult to pinpoint. The reality, as I said, of memories, the reality of feelings, the reality of uh, feelings awoken by literature. You know, what's the difference between the real deal and the perceived or the felt thing that, you know, might be artificial? Third couplet, which is the second parallelistic one. The moon shines over the great ocean. Pearls weep. The sun warms blue mountain. Jade smokes. Uh, so as I said, this couplet feels a bit more visual, but again, it's, um, it's infused with lots of anecdotes that would you know, lots of literary antecedents which, which seem to be the ones that need 
to be known to clarify the meaning of the couplet. Uh, this is very clearly parallelistic, even in the translation. So moon, sun, shine, warm, uh, great ocean, blue mountain, pearls weeping, jade smoking. So the parallelism is very clear. So we get two images, almost pictorial in their nature, yeah, very evocative. If the two previous examples were about two mythical figures and uh, their ambiguity, these two images have, you know, they are images of nature, the moon shining over the ocean, the sun warming a mountain, and an effect being produced, uh, pearls weeping in the first case, jade smoking in the second one. So much more visual than the previous than the previous uh, couplet. So you could make a painting with the moon shining over the ocean or the sun warming a mountain. Now the first line, uh, the moon shining over the great ocean and pearls weeping, there are many anecdotes that, that could be related to this. So one of them is the belief that pearls are formed under full moon. So when the, full, when the moon is full, um, oysters would produce pearls and when it's not full, they wouldn't produce anything in the new moon. There's another anecdote about a mermaid who cried and her tears became pearls. Anyway, the image is supposed to be a melancholy and sad one. So the moon is shining over the ocean, the pearls are crying, or the pearls are, are, are coalesced tears. So whatever, the, whatever is behind this uh, emotional line or this emotional picture of nature, a sad feeling is meant to be represented. And the same with the other line, the sun warms Blue Mountain, Jade smokes. Now there are many anecdotes here. One of them is about a woman who was not able to, to marry her beloved and so she disappeared into thin air, into thin smoke. And you do see, you do appear to be having images in which something in nature produces the disappearance or, or the melting away of um, something precious. So the moon shining over the ocean makes the pearls weep, the sun warming blue mountain makes the jade smoke, makes the jade disappear. So very hard images to interpret, but they seem to be pointing in this way. In some natural phenomenon is causing the, the suffering or the disappearance of the destruction of something precious. Uh, in Chinese poetry we've seen it time and time again. And, and you can see this very well also in classical Chinese painting. Um, Chinese thought, classical thought, um, you know, has this very strong correlative streak, which also appears in its philosophy. This idea that nature mirrors man and man mirrors nature. The microcosm of humanity, of the individual, is connected to the macrocosm of um, the heavens, of the cycles of nature. <laughs> And it's a very typical conceit in painting and in poetry to use what appears to be an objective description of a natural scene, of natural scenery, of seasonal scenery, as a coded way of talking about the feelings of the poem. So these sad images evidently evoke the sad feelings of the poem. Perhaps through these two images he's evoking the melancholy feelings that can be provoked by the poem through his writing, through the images he uses for writing literature. Perhaps he is not just showing the technique or the effects that literature and the techniques that literature uses to create feeling. He might be also transmitting his own feeling, his frustration that we mentioned before at, uh, at having been successful in office. So he is sad. He is like a weeping pearl. He is like jade smoking away, a precious material that is not being properly used. Again, these images could be also used for love longingless, whether, whether he is sighing and remembering or reminiscing a dead wife or a frustrated love affair in the past. So it could be evoking those sad, melancholy situations. Finally, the last couplet, which generally rounds, uh, sums up and tries to round the poem with an adequate finish. And, this feeling might have lasted forever in my memory, but in the moment it was already fading away. So at least in this translation, I think this last couplet points to all this consolidation of, of the poem as a, a painting of past emotions, of, 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 of emotions which are real or unreal. Uh, are they real when the poem is writing them in a poem? 
they might have been real in the past, but is the poet sure they were real, or is he just remembering those emotions, those feelings in, from a remote past, and perhaps you know they weren't so intensely felt then? Is the writing creating the emotions by itself, or evoking the these emotions from the past? So all of these ambiguities that the poem has been waxing about um, seem to be emphasized in this in this paradoxical ending where he thinks these feelings seem to last forever in my memory and yet they seem to be fading away now are they permanent or are they temporary were they real then are they real now so so the poem ends on this big note of ambiguity so as i said this could be a poem about many different topics and uh, the translation also pushes one way of reading it or another way of reading it. Now let me read you now, Lee, to conclude, I'm going to read uh, the two other translations of this poem that I have available here at home. So this is Li Shangjin's. The ornamented thither. The ornamented thither, for no reason, has fifty strings. Each string, each bridge, recalls a youthful year. Master Zhuang was confused by his morning dream of the butterfly. Emperor Wang's amorous heart in spring is entrusted to the cuckoo. In the vast sea, under a bright moon, pearls have tears. On Indigo Mountain, in the warm sand, jade engenders smoke. This feeling might have become a thing to be remembered. Only at the time, you were already bewildered and lost. So, for example, in this interpretation, the ending seems to point to the idea that even when the feelings that um, created this poem, that are behind the creation of this poem, were felt, already then was the, was the poet, the poetic persona, feeling confused or uncertain. And then this uncertainty is not just a product of literary crafting or the passage of time, but rather of, um, of, you know, the basic ambiguity and unknowingness of the poet himself. So, very, very curious, very, very interesting. And as I said, there is a, another translation, which I am looking for right now. This is in A.C. Graham's Poems of the Late Town, which is an anthology of different poems and different poets, basically Tu Fu, Men Chiao, Hang Yu, Lu Tung, Li Ho, Tu Mu, and Li Shangjing. So, the patent lute. It comes with a long introduction, which I'm not going to, to read. Mere chance that the patent lute has 50 strings, string and fret, one by one, recall the blossoming years. Chang Tzu dreams at sunrise that a butterfly lost its way. Wang Di Bequeath his spring passion to the night jar. The moon is full on the vast sea, a tear on the pearl. On blue mountain the sun warms, a smoke issues from the jade. Did it wait this mood to mature with hindsight, in a trance from the beginning, then as now? <laughs>